Hello, my name is Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stona Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on the Villary Hill in Stona, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorialchurch.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. Sabbath. Feliz Sábado. We're really happy that, uh, that you are joining us this morning, and I think it's a special day uh, because we get to fellowship uh, here at church and also those who are watching us at home or wherever you are, we want to also welcome you to God's church. I don't know if this is possible, but I asked Chris to do something. And maybe the church board is going to stone me after this. But uh, you think that we could hum? Okay. We could hum. If, if they say that we cannot sing, probably we could hum. Nothing between, what is it? Yes. I think we could hum in the church. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. And I hope that that's our prayer this morning. Again, we want to welcome you to our church. And we're excited that you're worshiping with us this morning. So we're again encouraging you to social distance. And uh, um, to wear your masks. And also um, when we... Uh, when we exit, we're going to exit through the right door and keep your social distance here also. As we exit in, the deacons will um, direct that. And also, uh, when we leave here, they told me that no gatherings outside, but you can have gatherings on the street, which <laughs> that's what they told me. <laughs> and just the messenger. But, uh, uh, but yes, but, but I'm glad that we can fellowship, you know, in whatever way we can. And uh, um, we're also uh, happy this morning because uh, Larissa, is that the right pronunciation of your name? La close, close, close. Larissa, I, I'm going to say Larissa, I'm going to pronounce her in Spanish. Okay, Larissa. Bunsinski? Okay. Yes. Uh, she is moving her membership to our church. And, uh, uh, you know, we want to make it official. And, uh, um, and all of those who want to welcome her into our church, I want you to say amen. amen. And those who are watching can also say welcome. Yeah, so Larissa, we're, we're thankful, and, and that, uh, yes.
Yes, we're, we're happy that, uh, that you're part of our church family. Yes, and we look forward to what God will do in your life here as you um, join in our ministry here in this community. Yes, we're thankful that you're part of our family. Okay, and I guess that's all the announcements we have. Well, good morning, boys and girls. My name is Lisi, and I know that you don't know me, but I was asked by somebody in your church to share a story with you today, and I've got a story to share. So last weekend, I went camping with a friend. How many of you like camping? I love it. I like sleeping in a tent, although sometimes it's not as comfortable as sleeping in my own bed, but it's still fun. And I like being able to see the stars at night when it is super dark. And I also like, oh, I really like making a campfire. That's probably my favorite part. Have any of you ever helped make a campfire? Isn't it fun to just sit around it and watch it, and especially at night when it gets really cold and you can sit around the campfire and feel that warmth? Isn't that fun? Well. What we did with my friend was actually to make some campfire bread. Do you guys know what that is? So campfire bread is when you make the dough just like if you were making bread at home, but then you grab some very, very clean sticks and you wrap the dough around it. And then you put that stick over the campfire and you keep turning it slowly, slowly until it bakes. And when it's completely cooked, you can eat it. Now you have to be careful though, because if you don't turn constantly the bread and you just kind of leave it hanging over the flames of the fire, it burns. It's going to catch on fire and then you won't be able to eat it. But we had some good luck and we were able to make some very tasty bread. Something else I like about camping um, is being able to see all nature, the trees and the sky and birds and squirrels. We even got to see an elk that was running up into the woods. An elk is, is a very, very large animal, but around this area there are a lot of them and sometimes you can see them when you're camping. Now on Sabbath, we went for a hike in the afternoon and very close to our campground, there was a river, a very clear, clean river. You could walk into it and no matter how far you went and how deep it got, you could still see your toes very, very clearly. That's how clean and clear it was. But it was also very cold because the water in that river comes from the snow that is melting on top of the mountains. So that water is very cold, but it was a hot day. The sun was out and so people were swimming in the river. Some were floating uh, down the river and it was just a really good day to be out in the water. And as we walked along the river shore, we saw a big group of people that were kind of together and they were all looking in one direction and we wondered what they were doing. So we kind of got close to that group of people. And then we noticed that across the river, kind of high up there, there was a rock. And there were kids who were walking up to the rock, uh, the edge of the rock, and then they would jump into the river. There was a very, very deep part. So they knew they had to be very careful and jump right there in that deep part. Um, and then they would swim back to shore. And the kids would jump and swim back to shore and then climb back up on the rock and jump again and then swim back. But there was one girl, she must have been maybe nine or 10 years old at most. And she would walk up to the edge, look down and then get scared and walk away. And other kids would jump and she would again come up to the rock and. She was scared. She didn't want to jump. 
Well, she did, but she didn't know how. And so several friends talked to her and encouraged her. And then the people that were watching them started cheering for her. Now, her parents might have been there, maybe a brother, a sister, but the rest of us were all strangers and everybody was cheering for her. You started hearing, come on, you can do it. Yeah, come on. And then she walked up to the edge and then everybody in the crowd started counting down really loudly. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. And we, when we got to two, she took a couple of steps back and you heard one, go. And she jumped and she came out of the water and everybody cheered very loudly. We whistled and we clapped and we all screamed. And we said, congratulations, yeah. Now, why did we do that? Well, we were happy, even though we didn't know her, we were happy that she was brave and that she had been able to overcome her fear and jump into that river, something that she wanted to do anyway. And you know, sometimes life is a little bit like that. There are things that we may want to do, but maybe Maybe you want to talk to a friend about Jesus, but you're shy. And you know, your friends at church, even though they don't tell you, and maybe they're not screaming and clapping and whistling, but they are cheering for you. So is Jesus in heaven and the angels. And you know when they cheer the loudest? They cheer the loudest when we make the decision to follow Jesus and to make him our best friend. Can you imagine? All of heaven going, congratulations, well done. Yeah, so that's what it feels like when we make a right decision, all of heaven and all of our church family and our family, our, our parents, our uh, brothers and sisters, they're like cheering us on because it's a great thing we've done. So that's my story. I just wanted to encourage you to make good decisions and to cheer others on when they make great decisions and they show that they're brave. Have a great Sabbath. It was good talking to you. Bye-bye. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 12, 21 to 24. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his robe, royal robes, sat on his throne, delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise of God, angels of the Lord stuck him down. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued increase and spread. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special day, holy day, for gathering us, all of us together here in person and online. And for those of who cannot make it here, please bless them wherever they are. We wanna pray for everyone this week who lost their loved ones, friends or family members. We want God to heal them on their broken heart. And we wanna pray for the sick who are suffering. Please give them not to suffer anymore. Give them eternal life. And please God, wipe this pandemic that's spreading all over the world. Give us healing, take it away from this world, from this earth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Do we still have that hope? Amen. Yes, Jesus is coming again, right? And, and he's coming soon for us. So it is, uh, those are the good news, the blessed hope that Jesus is coming soon and that we will be together with him. And I believe that that is what keeps us going during these times that we are living, having a hope that is not in this world, but our hope is in Jesus Christ, who is coming again. The title of my sermon this morning is uh, The Party is Over. And as we, as we talk about it, uh, what we're going to talk this morning, you're going to find that the kingdoms of this world, everything is coming to an end. But we know that Jesus Christ has been declared the king of this world, the king of the universe. And that though this world is coming to an end, Jesus' kingdom will soon take place. And the blessing that we have as Christians is that we are ambassadors for Christ. We share the good news that Jesus is coming soon, that Jesus is preparing a people, a remnant people, to take the message to the world. And we, and we read in the scripture that when this gospel of the kingdom will be preaching to all the world, and then the end will come. Yes, yeah, so there are throughout history, people who have opposed the message of Jesus. And we read here in the book of Acts, it starts with uh, chapter 12 and verse 1. It was during this time that Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intended to, to persecute them, well, it was more that he wanted to do. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that these met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this is happening during the time of Passover. During the time of Christ, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread were celebrated together in the first century. So it was seven days, and at the end of these seven days, he was also considering, he had the intentions of killing Peter. What happened is that he killed James. And you remember, if you have read the Gospel, that James is one of the two sons of Zebedee that were called the sons of thunder by Jesus. These are the two who approached Jesus when he was uh, going to the cross. Before he was going to the cross, they thought that he was going to be the king of Israel. So the mother of, the, of John and James approached Jesus and told him, Jesus, I want a petition from you. I want my two sons one on the right hand and one on the left side. That means she wanted the most important places and the kingdom for her two sons. And Jesus told her, you know, you don't know what you're asking. Are you ready to drink of the cup that I'm about to, to take? And they say, yes, we are ready. They didn't know what they were saying, right? But, but, but a few years later, James was ready to take that cup. You see, he was thinking of, of, a, of a position in Jesus' kingdom, but he was killed by Herod. He was the first of the 12 apostles to be killed. But this Herod, he was a good politician, and he wanted to make people happy, and they thought, okay, you know, he killed James, but... There was not a lot of people watching. We wanted to be 
at the end of the, of the Passover, when everyone is going to be here. So if we kill Peter, who is the leader of the church, these people will get discouraged, and this will, these people will quit. So, so we're going, so Herod says, okay, people are happy that I killed James, so now I'm going to please the people. I don't know if that sounds familiar to some things that you see during this time, that uh, people like to, especially politicians, like to please people. That's why I believe that we shouldn't follow politicians, that we should follow Jesus Christ. If we follow partisan politics, we're going to be disappointed because there is no political party that has the solution for the things that we're going in this world right now. The only solution for the things in this world is Jesus Christ. So Herod, right? This, this is Herod, and we read this name several times in the Gospels, and we think, wow, he lived that many years? But it's, this is a different Herod. But I want us to understand what is happening here. This is the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one that we remember that killed the babies when Jesus was born. Herod the Great was a, was a bad man. He even killed his sons. So two of, he, one of the sons that he killed was the father of Herod Agrippa. So Herod Agrippa is the grandson of Herod, and he is the cousin and brother-in-law of Herod Antipas, which is the one who was in the trial of Jesus, and is the one who killed John the Baptist. So you see how things run in this family. They are in not very good relationships, but they know how to preserve power. And it seems to me that parents have passed down to their children some of these things. That's why I think it's, we have to be really careful you know, the way that, that we raise our children. Because even when we don't think what we're doing, we're transmitting to them certain habits, certain things that we have. That's why uh, one of the stories in the Old Testament that is my favorite is the story of Sansom and how both of his parents wanted to know how to raise this child. The same thing with John the Baptist. Their parents wanted to know how to raise their child. So I believe that God can give us wisdom and God can give us also grace because all of you who are parents know that a lot of times we make mistakes with our children. And I always pray, God, help me that even if I make a mistake, that Jesus can cover that mistake and can help them to see Jesus even in, in how broken and how sinful we are, that they be able to see Jesus Christ. But you see, they have passed down these things to their children. But this Herod had connections. He had connections with, with the Roman emperors, and because he had connections with them, he was able to, to have uh, a lot of power. He is so powerful that he thinks that he can destroy the church. And that's, that's the biggest mistake, right? Because no one can destroy God's church. So James is executed by Herod. So Peter, if you were Peter and you are in prison and you know that the next day you're going to be before Herod, how will you sleep that night? You know, I find it really interesting because a lot of times we have problems falling asleep because of things that happen in our lives, right? Sometimes there are bills. Okay, I have so many bills that I cannot fall asleep. Or I have problems that I cannot fall asleep. But Peter, as we read in the story, 
He had learned something. He was trusting in Jesus. So he is surrounded by 16 soldiers in a very secure prison, humanly impossible to escape, but he's trusting in God, not trusting that God will deliver him, though he knows that God can deliver him because he has delivered him before. But he's trusting that God knows what's best for him. That is really difficult, I believe, for us to understand what is God's will for us. Because a lot of times we, we make our plans and we think, okay, this is the best, the way I see it, so this must be what God wants for me. And then we realize that that's not what God wants for us. But Peter understands how God works, so he's trusting in God. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. He's writing this years later after, after this. But I find really interesting what he tells us here. And I believe that, that this is something that we can learn for our lives. He says, Peter says, Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So the way I, I think of anxiety is those things that affect me, that are in my mind all the time. And he's telling us, cast all of that on Jesus because he cares for you. So I believe that's what he did. He cast all his anxiety, all his fears on Jesus, and he was able to sleep, even though he knew that the next day, Herod wanted him to be executed. Psalms 55, 22. Another promise that God tells us. He says, cast your burden on the Lord. And he will sustain you. He will never, he will never permit the righteous to be moved. I believe that these, are, these promises of God apply for us. During this time that we are living in this world. Because there is anxiety of not knowing what's going on. There is anxiety of not understanding the things that are happening around us. There is anxiety because we cannot control those things. So instead of, of battling all those things, the Bible tells us that we need to give all those things to Jesus because He cares for us. He will never allow his righteous, allow his people to be shaken, to be moved. So that's why he is sleeping, because he trusts God. But there is also something else that is happening while he is sleeping, because the church is not sleeping. The church is praying for him. And I believe that this is what God wants to tell us, that we need to be able to pray for each other. We need to be able to come together and pray so that we can share with each other some of the things that we're going through. So the church is not sleeping. They are praying. And this is kind of ironic the way I see it. Because a lot of times we see these stories in the Bible and we think, whoa, these people have really good faith. I am not close to how they are. But then we see that God works even when we don't have faith. Did you know that? So Peter, I'm sure that he was also, you know, he's surprised. Even though he's seen angels before, he is surprised. He still thinks that he's dreaming. And the text here that an angel struck him, in the Greek word, that word is kick him. So the angel kicked him, and then he wakes up, and then he realized that it's not a vision. It wasn't that hard. Because the angel also struck Herod at the end, and Herod died. 
So he only struck him a little bit so that he could wake up. I believe that God does, does to us sometimes to get our attention so that we wake up, that we realize the times in which we are living. He doesn't destroy it, but yeah, he does something so that we lift up our heads and we see who is in control. Yes, but, uh, um, but the church is praying. Peter doesn't believe. And then, right, then the church doesn't believe that God answers the prayers. Because the, the, when Peter goes and knocks on the door, the, the, the servant girl comes and, and she tells them, you know, Peter is at the door. Our prayers have been answered. And they are like, it must be his angel. You're crazy. We don't believe you. I don't know if you've ever been like that. That, that you pray, but you didn't really believe that God was going to answer. And God surprises you that he answers. Remember, the disciples were trying to cast out a demon, and they couldn't. And this man goes and tells Jesus, Jesus, can you? And Jesus says, of course, but do you believe? And the man is honest. That's what I like about the story in this man in the Gospel of Mark, that the man is honest. It says, I believe, but not enough. Help my unbelief. And that is all that Jesus wanted to hear, that he was being honest. And then, you know, Jesus did the miracle for him. So a lot of times I believe that uh, uh, we just need to pray. Even if we don't have that strong faith, the moment that, that we start communicating with God, we're going to see his presence. We're going to start experiencing things in a different way in our lives. And, and I have been in those places that I pray for someone that God will heal him. But this man was, was in his last days of his life. And I always say this because God didn't do it because of me. Because I didn't have faith. I mean, not enough faith that God was going to heal him. But God healed this man. So after that, I learned that we need to pray. We need to pray and talk with God. It's not always going to be the same way because we have James. James didn't have a smaller faith than Peter. He was a faithful disciple of Jesus. But God decided that his his race had come to an end. So James was not less disciple of Peter because of that. And I think we need to understand that also. That even if God doesn't, under, doesn't answer the way that we want him to answer, we still need to give him glory and honor to him. Because he is still God. You remember the, the story of, of the Apostle Paul. He also was praying. And if, when we read about Paul, he was a faithful man. He was a faithful man. He was a missionary. He did miracles. But he prayed to God and he said, God, take this thorn in the flesh from me. And I like how, how Jesus responded to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul understands and he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is understanding that even when things don't go the way that we want, God still has a plan for our lives. So what do we do then? I 
I find this statement of, in the book called Prayer. That's a book that I want to recommend you. If, if you can get it online or you can buy it, but it's, it's a book on prayer by Ellen White. And in page 217, this is what she says. She says, as we acknowledge before God our appreciation of Christ's merits, fragrance is given to our intercessions as we approach God through the virtue of the Redeemer's merits. Christ places close by his eyes, encircling us, encircling us with his human arm, while with his divine arm he grasps the throne of the infinite. He puts his merits as sweet incense in the censer in our hands in order to encourage our petition. He promised to hear and answer our supplications. Well, I love that. That's why in the book of Hebrews we are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace because Jesus, his humanity, gets close to us. He knows, he understands, he experiences the things that we are going through, but with his divinity, he can reach to the throne of God for us. Ellen White also says that the angels are surprised that we don't pray more because they are waiting to intervene. They are waiting to do things for us and we don't pray more. I think that we in our homes need to pray more. In our churches, we need to pray more. The angels are willing and able to help us. We can see how the angels are at the service of God's people. They are ministering as spirits, the Bible tells us. And this is the promise that God gives to each one of us. Psalms 91, 11, and 12. He says, For he, that is God, will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. So we see that the angels... They help people in trouble. We see that in the book of Acts. Only in this chapter, the, the word angel appears seven times. Let us know that the angels are also interested in helping God's children. They also direct people. The way they directed Philip, the way they directed Peter, the way they, help, they directed Cornelius. But they also act as agents of judgment. So, you see, a lot of times, our faith is shattered because of the things we experience. And I have met many people that are angry at God because of things that have happened in their lives. Because God didn't answer the prayer the way that I expected that God was going to answer it. And I think that it's normal that, that sometimes we're angry but I believe that we need to continue talking with God. Because as we continue talking with God, we will understand more. And that's why the book of Job is one of my favorites. Because Job doesn't accept everything like, yeah, thank God for all of that. No, he's struggling. We can see a human being struggling, wrestling with the things that are happening in his life. But what he did is that he continued talking with God. He continued keeping that connection open. And at the end, he was able to understand that his Redeemer lived. And, and, and he knew that at the end, things will be okay. So, I, so yeah, there are people who, who, because of their problems, they have focus on their problems, and they forget to look a little higher. Because when we, look, when we look a little higher, that's where we see Jesus. 
So we were told that we needed to look a little higher. We need, we need to continue talking with him. There are people who become bitter and they turn their back on God because God didn't answer that prayer the way they expected. Other people have compromised their principles. I'm sure that for James, it would have been easier to, to renounce the belief in Jesus Christ and save his life. But he didn't. He remained faithful. But this is what we know. We know that those who oppose God, as Herod did, will be judged. And we end the story when Herod is in his royal robes and, and a historian of the first century, Josephus, a, a Jewish historian, he's also talking about what happened with Herod. And he said that Herod had his royal robes made of silver. He was in a way that the, that the sun will shine on him. That was his greater day, according to him. Because of his position that he had, he, he, he made the people of Tyre and, and Sidon to starve. So they went and they asked him for mercy. And the way that they know that they can get to him is that they start praising him. And they say, the voice of God and not of man. And when he thought that that was his greater day, his, his best day, that was the end of him. Because at that moment, that celebration, that party was actually over. At that moment, he was struck by the angel. And even though he looked good on the outside, we read in the Bible that he was eaten by worms. Because the reality is that those who are humble will be exalted, but those who are proud will be humbled. And it was Mary who says this. He says that proud will indeed be humble. God has always the last word. And you see, the last word for James was not said that day. Because the last word for him will be when Jesus comes and he will resurrect him. So that's why God has the last word. So even though Peter didn't die that day, by history and tradition, we know that he died some 20 years later. But he remained faithful till the end. So what is that God is trying to tell us this morning? I believe that he's telling us that we are living in similar times. When there is opposition against God's people. But things are going to get worse. But we need to be faithful, trusting in God. Because then, at the end, things will get better. Because God has the last word. And because he has the last word, the celebration, the party is actually over. Because God has said that Jesus is the king. And we who are his followers, he will make us, the Bible says, a kingdom of priests and kings. And we will be with him forever. So you see, things will get better. So I want us to encourage us to, to continue witnessing, sharing about the good news of Jesus. Sharing what God has done in your life with others. And I want to encourage you to stay faithful because what Jesus has for us is so great, it's so special 
that nothing of this world is worthy. Nothing of this world can be compared, Paul says, to that glory that will be revealed in us. So I want to encourage you this morning to be faithful, to surrender your life to Jesus, even when we don't understand. We need to trust Him. Yeah, during this time, it's been, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge because we, we have loved ones who have died. We have loved ones who are in hospitals. We have loved ones who, who are going through challenges. And we would like something to happen right now. And sometimes God seems that he doesn't answer the way that we want him to answer. But at the end, he will make things right. He will make all things new. And I'm looking forward to that day. But while we are here, let us remain faithful to him. Let us trust him. Let us give our lives to him. What do you say? Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank, we thank you because he is the king. He has the last word. And Father, help us also to, to be with you. Help us, Lord, to, to have a life of prayer as families, as our church, that we can continually pray, Lord, so that you can give us strength, that you can give us courage to face whatever things the enemy sends our way. And help us, Lord, to, to stay faithful, to be faithful till the end. Be with our church, Father. You know that uh, there are some in our church who have lost loved ones. There are some in our church who are going through some challenges. And Father, there are, there are some who probably are discouraged and don't know what to do. So Father, we ask that you send your holy angels close to us so that we can have a clear revelation of the character and the love of Jesus. That we will be transformed in such a way that the world will see Jesus in our lives. That we will reflect his love, his character. And Lord, help us. Help us to, to tell others what you have done for us. Give us opportunities to share about the love of Jesus with others. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hello, this is Pastor Christy Hodson. Thank you for watching our program today. We hope to see you soon in person or live on YouTube for our Saturday morning worship service. You can find more information about online Bible study groups at our website, stonemmemorialchurch.org. We currently have a food bank and clothing distribution center located at 9 Gary Street. We also operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool at 108 Pond Street. If you have any questions, please call us at 781 438-2977. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.